In this video, we'll cover seven key guidelines that the top 1% designers use to consistently outshine the other 99%. We'll do this by studying examples of great websites, all while transforming a bad website into a top tier one. Guideline by guideline, starting with the first one, typography. I've covered this in depth in another video, but we simply cannot create amazing websites without diving deep into the art of text. If we just look at any website, collection website, well, that's meta, we'll notice that a lot of websites rely almost solely on text and clean visuals, which is also an important thing that we'll get to later in this video, the visuals. Now, I almost always suggest that you stick with just one font for your website. But if you're rebellious and you just need to use two fonts for whatever reason, the world is gonna explode, zombie apocalypse, then I have a trick for you. First, you find an existing well-designed website that's using two fonts. Then if you're using Chrome or Brave browser, you just right click to inspect their text elements. Next, you head to computed and check the following. What's the font family? What's the font size? What's the font weight? What's the letter spacing? And what's the line height? Then you just head into your web design tool of choice. And since I'm using Framer, I'll just go into Framer and add this as a text style. I'll do that for each and every one of the text styles they have on their website. And once that's done, you have your text style guide. And now you can apply it accordingly. I usually use my H1 in combination with my biggest body text size for the hero and certain sections that I want to call out, like the last call to action section. Then I use the H2 as the heading for most other sections. And if you have multiple headings in one section, then I usually will gradually decrease the size like in this section. H2 for the main heading, then H3 for the subcategories. If you have a section where you need to cram even more information into it, like this social proof section, well, then I usually jump down one or two sizes even further for the headings. For the body text, I use body large for my H1s, body medium for the H2s, and body small for smaller details. Again, use your website of choice as a reference here. And there we have it. Just a quick typography change across the board and the website already looks so much better. But there is something else that not only breaks hearts, but also layouts, bad spacing. All the good looking websites you see on the web use good spacing. A lot of websites use different spacing, but they still somehow look good. So what spacing is the correct spacing? Well, as always in design, there is no one golden rule that just always works. But there is one neat little trick that I like. Spacing based on relationship. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at our design here, we can kind of agree that certain elements have a closer relationship than others. For example, this hero text has a closer relationship to the body text than it has to either of the two buttons. So with that, we can increase the distance between the text elements and the buttons. And for this increase, I like using a multiplier. If the text elements are spaced 24 pixels apart from each other, then the space between the text elements and the buttons should be two times that. So 48 pixels, math. Same for the button and the text below. They belong together and should probably live happily ever after together. There's no such thing as happily ever after. So 24 pixels again. The same goes for the next section, but since the text sizes are a bit smaller here, what we can do is to reduce the base spacing. So instead of 24 pixels, we can use 16 pixels. The text elements belong together and the icon or image will be pushed with a multiple of Two. Now, while not a 100% exact science, because nothing in design is, you can use this multiplier relationship concept in most cases to get a nice enough breathing room between a group of text and an image, for example. I'll make sure to have at least 80 to 96 pixels of distance. You'll have to eye this a bit and see what looks good with 
your eyes, but generally more breathing room is the safest route. One caveat here though, if you have a big container, then just make sure your text content doesn't span wider than 600 pixels because if the container of text is too wide, then the reading experience takes a big hit. For the vertical spacing in a section, I usually go with at least 160 pixels on each side. And for paddings and cards and other content wrappers with smaller content like this, 32 pixels as a baseline rarely goes wrong. But keep in mind, the larger text you have, usually the bigger spacing you'll need here as well. Two guidelines in, and it's already starting to look like something we could proudly show our mother-in-law, but it's still lacking structure. So next up, grids. You see, using grids allow us to make sure that our designs are visually structured, that they look nice to the eye, once again. You'll see it in action all the way from bento grids to artistic websites relying on typography and imagery. Some 1% designers do this without even using grid features in tools like Figma or Framer, and others use the grid features available to them. By the way, if you want to learn how to use Framer to build fully custom websites just like this one super quickly, feel free to join the waitlist to my upcoming Zero to Hero course. The link's down below. In the end though, it doesn't really matter if you use the grid features in the tools or not. The most important thing is that things look structured. But if you're a beginner, it can really help to just throw on the grid feature. Then make sure you have a container box of a decent max width. I like 960 pixels for this design. Now you just have to make sure that most of your content stays in here. And I say most because there's an important exception to the rule that we'll get to a bit later. I also like dividing my inner content into equally sized chunks, whether it's two by two, three by three, or one by one. And since we have everything in our 960 pixel max width container, you'll see that, for example, all the two by twos line up nicely with each other, even if we throw them around. Ah, structure, the ultimate antidote to any layout OCD. But if we rely only on this, it could risk becoming a bit monotonous. Which brings us to the next point, breaking the monotony. As much as we like predictability and patterns and grids, we as humans also kind of like sometimes when the rules are broken. And this is a super important aspect of creating good looking websites. We need to break the monotony. You'll see this in action all across the web. We stick to our grid and then we break it. We stick to our pattern and then we break it. We make it predictable and then we surprise. So sometimes we need to break the beautiful grid that we just created. Typical places would be the logo sliders where we'll just have it continue into infinity or even carousels like this social proof carousel here. We can have it start in the grid on the left, but then bleed outside on the right. Same with the last call to action section here. After using images in a very consistent manner throughout the website, here we mix it up by throwing it into the open space and center aligning the text container. You know what? Let's even center align the hero text container, because why not? I like to think of the goal of this exercise to be achieving a website flow that resembles a wave. So we have the typography, we have the spacing, we have the structure and we break the structure. Life is good, but with that said, none of this would really matter in the end if we had shitty colors, which brings us to colors. And I'm not going to linger too much on this one because it's kind of a super covered topic already, but I will give my perspective on it and maybe a little system you can use. Now, colors can make websites pop, give them character, have them stand out, and it can also destroy websites, make them look unprofessional draw attention away from the most important things. So it's very important that we use colors carefully. And the most foolproof system that I found is to just use three colors. One base color for your website background, one primary color for your call to action and 
potentially small details, and one neutral white or dark, depending on your theme, for text elements. The only rule here is to make sure that your base color and your primary color have a good contrast. Then just head to either a website you like and take inspiration from their palette or go to coolers or any other color tool and find your palette. Now, once you have the palette ready, you can start assigning colors. Again, base color for background, primary color for call to actions, and in this case, for icon details and the logo types. Then neutral color for text. To round off as a sneaky little ninja move, we'll use opacities of the neutral color for our text elements. I like to use around 80% for the top size and 70 to 60% for smaller sizes to create a nice hierarchy. Just make sure that all your text sizes maintain good readability. Then you can use the primary color with 5% opacity for secondary buttons and cards that you wanna call out without stealing the show. Look at the difference this color shift made for the website. Now we're getting close to the final result, but there are two important things left. And let's start with the first one, visuals. I mentioned this when I talked about typography and it cannot be neglected. Just take a look at this website by Wealth Simple. This beautiful piece of HTML and CSS is basically just visuals. Even without the text, it would still look amazing. But not everyone can get clean and crisp visuals like that, right? Or can they? With free video websites like Pexels, Figma's community files with illustrations, the 3D assets shared in Spline's community, and Midjourney or Dolly, you have so many options. There really are no excuses for bad visuals in this day and age. Sorry. Now, to give you just a fast and easy example, I'll show my 30 second workflow with Midjourney. First, I ask myself what niche I'm in. For this example, agriculture. Then I ask myself what kind of style I want. In this case, I think isometric 3D would be cool. Lastly, I ask myself what kind of colors I need. And this is important because we want our image assets to blend really nicely with our overall website. Lastly, I just make sure to write a prompt that includes white background. Now I can produce a bunch of cool visuals, download them, remove the background and upscale them in a tool like Canva, and then add them to my website. And this change to modern and crisp image assets brings us almost all the way to the final website. We're like 80% of the way. And the last 19% comes from the details. And this is where a lot of people trip up. This is where websites quickly become a mess. It's where people start adding anything and everything to give life to a design, but in the end, it just turns out bad. So we have to be careful at this stage. We don't want to overdo it. And my best rule of thumb and guiding light in design always is to keep it simple and minimal. One of the most popular things on websites right now is the glow effect. And I think we have linear to thank for this. So fine, we'll give into the trend and we'll add a glow, but we'll make it subtle. I'll take the logo we have, I'll upscale it, blur it out and throw it behind our image. Doesn't have to be the logo you have. It could be just a shape with a linear gradient or a radial gradient, or as in this case, an angular gradient with a blur and some fading, maybe some opacity. I can then reuse the same technique to create pieces of delight throughout the whole design by just decreasing the opacity a bit. To make the buttons feel less flat and lifeless, we can add a tiny little white inner shadow to the top and a faded out drop shadow. Same for the secondary buttons. Here I'll add a primary color border of 5% opacity along with the shadow. This exact style, I'll then just copy over to the card components. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are done. We went from this uninspiring, below average website into a very crisp and modern website with just seven guidelines. And to be completely honest with you, creating websites like this gets even easier when you use a tool like Framer. So if you haven't already checked out my upcoming Framer course, you can check it out 
in the link down below. Now, until the next one, have a great life.